All right, welcome back to Pastor's Point. We are going to be jumping into session eight today. We're going to be talking about decision making. There is a process in decision making that can really help us evaluate what decision is best to make. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. Maybe you're in the midst of making a decision on purchasing a house or getting married or a decision on your occupation or the vehicle you're driving. I mean, some of these decisions are a lot more minor, but on major decisions, how do we make them? What's the process or the most successful process at making them? I just want to give you some thoughts today that might help you make better decisions in the future. Let me start by saying this is point number one, so to speak, on the decision-making process. Energy spent must be directly proportional to the risk of the consequences, okay? So energy spent must be directly proportional to the risk of the consequences. It's kind of like hip shooting with nuclear weapons, okay? I mean, it's just a hip shot. It's just a quick thought, quick decision, but it has drastic impact, okay? So we need to identify the amount of energy compared to the the proportional amount of risk because there is a risk and reward quadrant. Uh, you probably heard it said, even in marriage, choose what hill you'll die on, so to speak. What arguments are really worth fighting for and what arguments are really worth winning, right? Because sometimes you'll find that you die on that hill. So evaluate the risk versus the reward. Identify how much energy you're putting into the decision in direct proportion to the risk associated with that decision. Now, if it's just a decision of buying a car and you make the wrong decision, you have a car that you have to put up with for a little bit. Probably not very life altering. Marriage, on the other hand, it's a very big decision. It's a lifelong commitment. And so the amount of energy that you invest in that decision needs to be a much more probably than purchasing a vehicle. Okay. Uh, A a lot bigger results as, uh, you know, there's a lot bigger results to uh, who you're going to marry than there is to what car you're going to purchase. Um, it's kind of like having a, a brainiac. You, you might have the smartest guy in your organization, and he's, if he's working the front desk selling candy, he's probably in the wrong spot. So we sometimes have to identify even uh, the decisions that we make of where we place people or who's going to take this job. You know, it's, it's very important that we get that right. Number two on making decisions. Questions for decision making, risk analysis. Okay, so here's some questions in this process of making decisions. How important is this to you? How important is this decision? How time sensitive is it? I think these are all great questions to write down when you're in the process of making major decisions. How time sensitive is it? Can it wait or do I need to address it right now? Um, decisions on healthcare. Oftentimes, those are decisions that are absolute major decisions and oftentimes they can't wait. So those are moments where you're pouring a lot of energy into making the decision because the risk is great. Is there a chance it can get more or less critical if we wait? So if you answer the question, can this wait? And the answer is yes. It's like, okay, well, what are the ramifications of waiting? And is it, you know, is it fatal to put this on hold or do we need to move forward now? Uh, A third thought on this, on how time sensitive it is, would be this. Can I test it? You know, is there an opportunity to test the waters, to test drive the vehicle prior to purchasing it? Can I walk through the house and have inspections? Is there a way to test things before you make that big decision? Okay. Uh, One example of that might be uh, if you're wanting to be a police officer, maybe the test before you invest all the years in college, going towards that type of degree, or become, you know, taking the tests that you need to to become a police officer. Maybe you do a ride along first to make sure that it's something that you want to do. Maybe you ask an accountant if they'll mentor you a little bit or if you can take them to lunch. Is there a way that we can test before we jump into this major decision? I think those are great questions to ask, whether it's 
Maybe it's hiring an employee. Can you bring them on as interns first so that it's, it's less detrimental to them and the organization if it doesn't end up working out? Can I get them for a couple of weeks or even on a temporary basis? I was just talking to somebody at a hospital and they're doing three month uh, uh, contracts for traveling nurses right now. And what a great opportunity for that hospital if they identify this person's phenomenal. You know, I don't know what the arrangements are, but I, I would see that as a great opportunity to test the waters to see if they're going to be a great nurse. And if they are, maybe they want to stay on long term and you can offer them a permanent package. Um, I remember when I made a transition from Lansing as a youth evangelist there and in kind of an interim type youth ministry position when they asked me to uh, go to Grand Blank, one of our daughter churches, it was a six week commitment. And so for six weeks, I got to work with the students, work with the staff, be in the facility, be in the community eating lunch. And I really got to test the waters on whether or not Grand Blank was a good fit for me. And after three weeks of being there, it became evident that that is where God was calling me. And so those are type, some of the things. So here's some questions for your decision-making process. Let me go over these again. Number one, how important is this decision? How time-sensitive is this decision? And the last one is this, is do I have the reserves to risk this now? So if it doesn't go well, do I have the reserves emotionally to handle it? If it doesn't go well, do I have the reserves emotionally to make the move? Um, and do I have the physical reserves? And even financially, maybe you're taking a pay cut or maybe there's a season of time where you're not going to get your first paycheck. Are you able to afford it? So do you have the reserves to take the risk? Third is organi organizationally. Uh, as far as staff, board, and constituents, do I have the reserves right now with the organization? Do I have the teamwork in place? Do I have the structure and infrastructure in place that I need to to move forward? If you're making a decision to bring somebody on, do you have the office space? Do you have the finances? You know, those types of things. Can I, and here's, I think, the most important part of this on the reserves part. Reserves versus risk is can you live through it if it ends up being a bad decision? And I'm not just meaning live through it physically. I'm meaning can you live through it financially? Can your organization survive? Can you emotionally and physically handle it if it doesn't work out? Um, and so I think those are some of the things, the questions that we can ask in the process of making decisions that will help us make them. It becomes like a risk and reward quadrant and helps us to make good decisions. Three important uh, questions here that I think that we could also look at. Three more, got a lot of questions here. Can I deal with the stress or the loss? Do I lose if I don't do this? What about the press? What about the PR, the public relations side of things? Now, this can't be the first concern because there's times that we make decisions that aren't popular as leaders. So our first concerns can't be the press or the public relations, but I think answer A and B can be first is can I deal with the stress or the loss and what do I do if I lose? Or what do I lose if I don't do this? So if I do do it, what's the risk? If I don't do it, what's the risk? So these are some important things. Now, maybe you're making decisions and they're not individual decisions, but they're team making decisions. It's an entire team or a church board, or a leadership team, or maybe you're making decisions as a family where there's multiple people involved. Let me give you some pointers because it's a drastic difference from making individual decisions that you're solely responsible for versus a group of people making decisions, okay? Because this is where turmoil can really uh, become apparent when you have multiple people making decisions. So let's talk about this. Number one, frame the question and isolate the real issue. What are we deciding here? You need to be very clear when you come together as a group of people, what is it that we need to decide? Okay, well, we need to decide, are we going to uh, move mom into a nursing home or are we gonna move mom into one of our houses? So, we're, so in, as a family, we would be framing the question in that way. 
It's what are we going to do with mom? What are we going to do with dad? Or in an organization as a church board, who are we going to hire? We, we, we have to establish some parameters and some framework because we need to hire a pastor. Okay, so what is it that we are deciding? That needs to be the number one thing thrown out on the table so there's clarity on the direction the meeting is going. Another thing is gather the information, all right? You need to gather all of the information, get the right people in the room, identify whether or not you need advice from outside people. So let's frame this, uh, what do we do with mom and dad question as a family making a decision. Do we need to get some people around the table? Maybe we need to get the medical professionals. Maybe we need to set the meeting at a, a care home where a nursing home type facility so that we can ask questions to those that have the answers. Um, are there certain people that need to be around the table? Are there outsiders that need to give advice that we need advice from? And uh, so those are kind of gathering the information, right? Who needs to be at the table? What information do we need so that we can make the right decision as a team? Here's another thing. Honest, confrontive debate. I think that sometimes we need to open the table to hear other arguments. It needs to be honest, confrontive debate. We don't need to come in as a dictator in a team decision-making environment and try to rule the roost. We need to take times where we keep our mouth silent and we open our ears to hear what other people are saying. In the multitude of, uh, of witnesses, there's wisdom. We need to draw other people in as well. Also, oftentimes, there's people who are more introverted and silent in meetings like that. We need to give them a platform to speak so that their, uh, so their opinions are heard as well. We need to identify pros and cons. Maybe we put a, wipe, a whiteboard up or we have a chalkboard or we have somebody taking notes. And as we hear everybody speak to the issues that we're making decisions about, we write, what are the pros and what are the cons? Okay, the pros of moving mom into the house instead of in a nursing home is we have her at home with us. Okay, what are the cons? Well, the cons are it's going to take a strong back to help them take baths or you know, get them from one place to the other. Or maybe one of the people in the home has to quit their job so that they can focus more care. So it's identifying those pros and cons so that they're clearly stated and you can articulate those. Now, here's an important thing in team decision making. Do not let anybody remain silent and never speak up. Okay? Now, you might like, if you're a, a leader that likes to be heard and you're loud and, uh, and very confrontive, you might like those that sit quietly and just kind of come under the thoughts that you're presenting. But can I tell you that that can bite you in the long run? We need to let everybody at the table speak. We need to really put people in the position that if they wanted to be around the table and wanted to make the decision that their voice is heard. Because otherwise, here's what can happen. Everybody comes up with an idea. You move to vote on that idea. You establish this is a direction that we're going. And one person was quiet the whole entire time. Let's say your idea goes south and completely ends in disaster. That one person that remained silent then could say, I knew it wouldn't work. That was a terrible idea. And instead, if you make them speak at the meeting, they can, they can say their point up front and maybe you go in a different direction by just merely hearing what they had to say. Or if they agree as well, they don't have the room to then accuse you later that you made a bad decision. So we need to get everybody in on this honest, confrontive debate, okay? They need to share in the decision. They need to share in the blame. They need to share in the victory of whatever that decision is. Here's another thing. Can I just encourage you? <clears throat> One of the worst things that you can do is after the meeting is all over, you and a couple others scurry off to the corner and have your own little meeting after the meeting. 
If you have something to say, say it at that table. Don't then go behind people's back and start gossiping and talking about the directions that things went. Let your voice be heard at the table and then refrain from meetings after the meeting. Next, cultivate the decision. Say it back to one another. Okay, let me get this straight. This is a decision that we're making. Maybe you write it down or you write it out. Okay, we're making the decision to move mom here. And I keep using mom and dad and all this. Maybe, maybe you're facing this type of thing. I'm not facing that right now in my, in my own life, but it's just an illustration. So you're saying it back to the group. This is a decision. Let me get this straight. This is a decision that we're making. Is, am I correct? And then you make everybody respond. Yes, that is correct. That is a decision that we're making. Now, in parliamentary type settings and things, what we do in the governmental type things in the church world or in the district world is we say, okay, is there a motion? Yes, there's a motion. Okay, the motion is this. We're going to move mom into Sally's house. Okay, is there a second? Yes, there's a second. Okay, all in favor say aye. Any opposed say no. And then if there's a no, you can say, okay, expound upon that, you know, or whatever. But, and you don't have to be that formal in a family type thing, but I can tell you this, in a more business type environment where it's team decisions or board or corporate decisions, it needs to be handled that way because it makes everybody have a voice and give input. Cultivate the decision, process it, require an answer from all. And then the last thing on team decision-making processes is this, have a plan of action. Who will do what? Okay, write it down. Who's going to do what? Bob, you're getting the prices on, or, or you know, whatever. You're, you're the one that's going to move mom's stuff into Sally's house. So, Bob, you've got the truck. Okay, perfect. When are you going to do that? So we start to design then a timeline. <coughs> so, Bob, you have the truck. You're going to grab all mom's stuff. You're going to move it to Sally's house, and you're going to do it by next week. Okay, perfect. So then that means that we can prepare mom's house to begin to sell or whatever it is, right? And so you're creating a plan of action. And then there's follow-up like, okay, hey, Bob, did you get that taken care of? Is everything out of mom's house? Yep, perfect. Okay, well, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna get with the realtor because that was my job. So now I know everything's out, Bob took care of that. And I'm gonna get with the realtor and I'll have the house listed in the next 20 days. And, and we'll get it for six. So you see, we have to have that plan of action in the follow-up. So that's part of team decision uh, making. Here's another one that's important. You need to thank everybody that's in the meeting, okay? As you close out the meeting, communicate to everybody, hey, I'm so glad and I'm so thankful for the time you invested in this and together we made a decision today. And you know what? We're in this as a team. <coughs> we succeed as a team and we fail as a team. And so... <coughs> it's, uh, it's important to uh, exhort those that are in the process of making this team. Now, why do bad decisions get made? Here, let me give you six reasons why bad decisions get made, and then we're going to be done for today. Number one, bad decisions get made because of fear. If you allow fear to be the dictating factor of your decision making, you're going to make a bad decision, okay? I, I was just at a 9-11 commemoration and I heard the speaker talking who is a firefighter and during his training as a firefighter, they had to hear radio communications that were taking place at 9-11 and they talked about these were good radio communications, these were bad radio communications. This was in the process of training new firefighters. So they would listen to these radio communications and be like, this was good because they were calm. They were collected. They spoke slowly and clearly. Therefore, we were able to act on what they were saying because it was understandable. Then they showed, they, they, they gave bad radio communications and it was where people allowed fear to grip their heart. And they were, they were speaking from a very rash, emotional tone that was not understandable. Their emotions were overtaking them and it paralyzed them from making a decision based on the communications. Same way in decision making. We can be paralyzed by fear. 
Here's another one that causes us to make bad decisions. Hypocrisy. The practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform to. Or a leader, here's, here's kind of an example of that. When a leader says, hey guys, we're on a spending freeze right now. Because our organization's struggling a little bit financially, but then all of the people that that leader just communicated to is seeing the leader spend tons of money flying first class, still traveling, still doing all the things he's told all of his subordinates that they can't do. That's hypocrisy. And that's when bad decisions get made. Okay, so we need to make sure that we as leaders are setting the example for the decisions that we've made. All through COVID, this has been such a uh, mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine type world that we're living in. And yet some of the restrictions that our governors have set, they violated themselves. And it's really painted a bad picture of some of our state leaders because we're seeing them do the very things that they told us not to do. That's hypocrisy. Very hard to make great decisions and move an, organizational, an organization forward when there's hypocrisy in the camp. Third thing is this, bad decisions are made because of the speed at which the decisions are made. Either you're making the decision too fast or you made the decision too slow. See, there's a season and a time for everything and we need to identify the timeline on things and make sure that we're following through uh, in due season at the right time. Uh, I've often heard it said that the fast eat the slow, but over delay, over delay can be the greatest risk. <clears throat> Sometimes we put it off because we are afraid, fear paralyzes us, therefore we put off the right decision-making process. So the speed at which we made the decision is actually the very reason that we made a bad decision. Fourth thing is this, <clears throat> bad decisions were made because of bad information. <clears throat> this is where communications came in, and this is why the fire department was so adamant about allowing the new firefighter cadets to listen to the radio frequency, the radio communication on 9-11 because it was such an intense environment. Bad information is often a key to making bad decisions, okay? Make sure that the information that you have is accurate, all right? For instance, if you're building a new facility, and you find a piece of property and you just take people's word for it and you don't really study, you don't really look at it, and then you find out that there's mines underneath and they're settling or there's maybe the whole entire lot is nothing but fill and you have to drill, you know, pylon type foundations that's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars more. A bad decision was made because you had bad information. Make sure that you have accurate information for whatever the decision that you need to make is. And that comes back to what we were just talking about, right? On the fact that we need the right people around the table. Maybe we need to bring in expert witnesses or we need to bring in that nursing home so that we're making good decisions with right information. So fifth thing is this, right information, but a bad analysis. It's the right thing for one organization, but it's not the right thing for another organization, okay? So we may have the right information at the table, but it may be a bad analysis. Maybe it's not for us, okay? Maybe the new facility isn't for us because then we realize it's gonna take us into debt and we can't make pay the bills. So what was right for that church or what was right for that organization or what was right for that leader is not right for us. We, we can often look at um, models that churches are using or listen to podcasts on how things are getting done in other people's lives. And we want to just apply everything that they're doing or everything that they're saying, but it may not be right for us. So it might be the right information. It's, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing and they're succeeding at it, but it won't work for us. It may also have to do with the demographic in which we're reaching, okay? So bus ministry probably won't work in an affluent neighborhood, but it'll work in a more inner city neighborhood. Food ministry might not work in a very affluent neighborhood, but it may in a, a, a more sore neighborhood where there's more people that are in need. Um, here's another, another one that will help us to make bad decisions. Not that we want to make them, but bad theology. Bad theology can be one of the things that causes us to make bad decisions. 
Religious beliefs and theory when systematically developed. 80-20 process. If you have 80% of it right and move forward, can you live with 20% of it being wrong? You know, I, I think that when it comes to theology or belief systems, it needs to be 100% based upon God's word. But there is a point where we probably won't all agree on the decisions that are being made. So then we have to have like a cutoff, right? Like at what point are we going to move forward with this decision, even though all of us don't agree? Do we move forward if 80% of the people agree and only 20% disagree? Do we move forward if the majority, maybe it's only 51% agree and 49% don't agree? I think that we have to have some parameters there. And often I think a good parameter, maybe it's for team making decisions as a board. Maybe it's for a church or another organization, a corporation, I think that if 80% of the people are on board, then it's probably a good decision. And, uh, and it would be based on good theology or good thoughts or a good belief system, okay? Now, Bible, <laughs> it needs to be 100%. We need to base our, our decisions and our thoughts 100% upon God's word. But in the decision-making process for organizations, I think sometimes we can look at uh, the 80-20 rule and apply it, and I think it's a pretty good metric. So uh, I hope that some of these factors about decision-making works. There's so much more that I could have gone over, but um, I, I just don't have the time to do that. Um, there are some great books out there on decision-making that, that you can get, and if you're interested in uh, reading some of those or some more resources, you can definitely contact our office and we would love to help you identify some, uh, some resources that might help you in whatever decision that you're making. Uh, I think it's important to be informed. It's important to research, um, especially when the risk is great. Um, oftentimes with greater risk, there's greater reward, but uh, there, there's definitely greater risk there too when there is a big reward. Uh, award that is available uh, in the decision-making process. So just, uh, just map it out, find out the right information, get the right people around the table, and move forward. Let the Spirit of God lead you in your decision-making. So I hope this helps tonight. Have a great day. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us.